Thank you for checking out our sermon here at New Grace. We are excited that you came across this message and are tuning in. It is our prayer that it is a blessing to you. We just want to make you aware of a couple things before we get to the message. First, we would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook at New Grace BC. Also, be sure to check out our website, reachingroanoke.com. There, you can find out more about who we are and where we are going as a church. Again, thank you for checking out our sermon here at New Grace. Please let us know of any questions you may have or any way that we can help you and your family. Enjoy the message. How many of y'all have a, not with you necessarily, uh, but maybe, because I know we live in a different time, a different age, a different culture, how many of you have uh, a physical copy of the Word of God? You have a Bible at home. How many of you actually, and again, if you don't read from the actual printed Word with technology, that's not necessary anymore, but how many of you, when you, you, you love reading from the Bible itself, I, I like. I love. I, I read it on my. I read it on my tablet. I read it on my computer screen. I read it on my my phone. I, I have a podcast I listen to. It's it's through the Bible. Uh, it's, it's not the one you're thinking of. It's a different one. Uh, and it's this guy. Uh, he's from South Africa, and he just reads scripture to you. And uh, so, you can, if you listen to the podcast every day, he will read the Bible to you in a year and uh, so he's got 365 podcasts and he's got some ambient music and it's just there's something about just hearing him read and when I'm driving down the road or when I'm uh, just doing some some tedious manual labor where I don't really got to focus much as having it I, I love that but there's something special about to me the the printed word of God a, a book you can hold and and something you can you can, I can mark in and I can highlight and I can write in and uh, I take extra care of my Bibles more so than I do any other book. Uh, I love books. I love to read. And uh, a lot of my books, uh, especially ones that I read over and over and over again, uh, they become tattered and torn. And uh, I lose the dust cover. And sometimes they get coffee spilled on them. And, you know, I'll turn to a certain chapter and there's a big coffee ring on it uh, because I was reading my coffee while I was re- reading that book. It, it, eating, drink, eating my coffee. Drinking my coffee when I was reading that book and set it down, and they get spills and stains, and maybe there's mustard from a bologna sandwich or something, and it's no big deal. Uh, but I don't like that with the Word of God. I, 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 I cherish it, and it, it's precious to me. And I think to most believers, uh, it is. And again, not just the printed Word of God, but the Word of God itself. And the fact that we have the words of God is incredible. Uh, it's a tremendous blessing that God has given us his very words to read, to study, to help guide our lives. And so we're going to begin a series tonight uh, entitled, The Word, A Life Guided by the Bible. And the Bible uh, provides instruction for our life. I remember years ago when I was a, a youth pastor, we used to have a little acronym for the Bible, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. And uh, the Bible is, is given to us by God to help us and guide us in every area and every aspect and every situation of our life. Whatever problem you're facing, the answer is in the Word of God. Now, you may have to look for it a little bit because it's not going to show up in the same way in your life as it does in Scripture. But God has given us the answer to every situation. God's told us how to have a good marriage. God's told us how to rear good children. God tells us how to work our finances, how to be good employees, how to be good citizens, how to be good followers of Christ. Everything we need to know to live a life that is honoring to God is in the Bible. But the Bible is more than just a source of information. It's more than just a reference manual. 
It's more than just something to look to to get good advice. God's Word possesses the power to transform us. It possesses the power to change us into the image of God. The Bible says about itself, it says it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, the word quick in that verse is the Greek word zao, and it means to live, to breathe, to be among the living. The Word of God is alive. It is active. It is a, a living entity, which is why it's just as relevant today as it was when it was compiled thousands of years ago. It's just as relevant to us today as it was to Paul. It's just as relevant to us today as it was to the ancient Israelites. Why? Because it is a living, breathing book. It is, it is active. It is life-changing. It is more than just a book that is full of good advice on how to live your life. But, and because of this truth, we're going to look at the, for the next four weeks, we're going to look at the attributes that, of the Bible that Paul describes in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I know I told you to go to Genesis. We're going to read a little bit in 2 Timothy. Then we're going to prove the point in, in, in Genesis chapter number 16. So whenever you travel to an unfamiliar place, on vacation, uh, maybe you go to a different city or you go to a different state, or maybe you travel outside the country, uh, it's good to have a tour guide. Uh, several years ago, or actually two years ago, me and April, we went down to Charleston for our 20th anniversary because Parker broke his leg and ruined our cruise. I'm still a little bitter about that. Uh, but so we went to Charleston for our 20th anniversary, and while we were there, we took a, a tour of the city. And it was one of the first days we were there, and it was a <clears throat> kind of a horse and buggy tour. And we got in, and they took us all around the city and showed us all the historic things. But they also showed us some really great places to eat. Uh, I love to eat, obviously. Uh, and they showed us some kind of, and me, me and April, we don't like chain restaurants. It's not that we don't like them. We ate Olive Garden today because it was there and we were hungry. Uh, but we prefer local restaurants. We prefer uh, things that are more, 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 you know, unique. And so he, they would show us some, some nice, uh, oyster bars. And, uh, if you've ever been to an oyster bar and eaten raw oysters when they're shucking right in front of you, oh, you have not lived. Just sucking down that snotty little thing. It is so delicious with the horseradish. And, oh, it's good. Uh, I love oysters. And so they show us some good seafood places. So, and they say, hey, if you like, uh, you like swing music or jazz music, this place has a, has a great music at, at, at night. And so they gave us some, some great places to go to, to really enjoy ourselves and gave us, you know, we'd ask, okay, what's the best beach to go to? Because we don't want to be on a very public beach. It's got everybody there. We just want to go to a beach where we can lay out under an umbrella and sleep for six hours no one's going to bother us because that's what you do at the beach without kids uh, and so they give us the great beach and so whenever you go somewhere that you're unfamiliar with it helps to have a guide they can help you learn the region they can inform you about the history that surrounds you they can give you context to the culture and help you focus on what is important and see uh, and, and things that are important and things that are important to see and do while you're there. In the same way, the Word of God is a tour guide for our life. It is the very words of God. It speaks into our lives. It shows us what's important to God. And whatever is important to God should be important to us. It tells us where to focus our attention. A lot of times we as believers, uh, we focus our attention on things that God doesn't really care about. Uh, I, we're going to be, a lot of us, are, and myself included, we're going to be surprised when we get to heaven and realize God didn't really care as much about some of the things we get hung up on as, as we care about. Uh, he didn't care about some of the issues we, we take issue with. He cares about getting souls saved. He cares about getting the gospel to the world. He cares about us living a life that is honoring to him. And so as we, we study the word of God, it, it shows us what is important to God and therefore is important to us and shows us what we should give our attention to as we go through life. Psalms 119.105 says that God's word is a lamp that lights the path of our feet that we should walk. It says, thy word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet 
and a light unto my path. Now, when David wrote this, he wasn't talking about the path he was walking physically. He was talking about the life that he was walking, the spiritual walk he was with, and it was talking about the way he should live, our, live his life. This is God's Word is what guides my life and shows me where to focus and shows me where to step and shows me the dangers ahead and shows me the pitfalls i got to watch out for and shows me the turns in the road i got to look out for. And so God's Word is to guide our lives. Look how Paul describes the power of the Word of God in 2 Timothy chapter Chapter 3, what is going on? Okay. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 16 to 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, first of all, that phrase, the man of God, a lot of times people can look at it and say, well, that's, that's good for the preacher. It's good for the missionary. It's good for the, the ministry worker. But if you look it up in the Greek, the word man there, it just means person, man or woman. So this verse is saying that the child of God, that's every one of us that are, that are believers, may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But the first thing that Paul shows us about how the Bible can be the guide for our life is he says it is profitable for doctrine. Now the word doctrine there is the Greek word didaskaleo. It means teaching or instruction. But that's not the first word that should jump out at us. The first word we should focus on isn't, oh, it's for doctrine. It's to learn the doctrine or the truth of the Word of God. The first word we should notice is the word profitable. It is to our benefit. It is to our advantage. It is to our profit to be taught by God's Word. When we live a life that is led by the Bible, we are at an advantage that the world that doesn't live their life according to the Word of God doesn't have. We have the advantage of the wisdom and the guidance and the knowledge of the Creator of our Heavenly Father. It is our advantage to turn to Scripture, but not just to learn again about the situations of life. It is to our advantage to turn to Scripture to learn about God Himself. To learn about His character. To learn about what He cares about. To learn about what He, what he wants us to focus on. Paul is saying that when, when, he, when we read God's Word, we are taught truth about God. The Bible is a library on the subject of God. There's a history section. There's a poetry section. There's a section on theology. There's a section on prophecy. And throughout all the Word of God, all 66 books, we can see how God is at work in this world, in man's lives, and who God is by His self-revelation of Himself in word and deed. So by reading the Scriptures... By studying the Bible, we are taught about God. We are taught about His character. We are taught about what, what He would like, what He needs us to do in our life. And as we, we are learn about God, that in turn guides our life. Because as we learn about God, we want to be more like God. And so we want to do what God would have us to do. And act how God would have us to act. And treat people how God would have us treat people. So as we learn about God, our lives are changed into, the, into what God wants us to do. And a perfect example of being taught about the character of God is found in Genesis chapter 16. So turn to Genesis chapter 16, look in verse number 9. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return unto thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, 
His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that, she, that, that spake unto her, Thou, God, seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore, the well was called Berla Hanaro. You can't pronounce it either. Uh, behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abraham called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram, Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. Now, of course, this, this story uh, it takes place in the middle of the story of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, God came to Abraham and told Abraham, I want you to leave uh, the land of your, your brethren, leave the land of your fathers, I want you to go to a land that I will show you, uh, a land that I will give you, and I will, I will bless you, and I will multiply you, and I will give you, uh, I will multiply your, your seed, and you'll have children that will outnumber the stars. And so in Genesis chapter 12, God meets Abraham and has this encounter with Abraham and calls Abraham to leave his home, and Abraham obeys. And so, but at the beginning of this chapter, in chapter 16, they've been gone from home for a while. They've been walking with God for a while, but they're struggling with trusting God. They're struggling with understanding what God is doing. Of course, at the beginning of the chapter, Sarah and Abraham, they're wrestling with trusting God because God, when they left years before, had told them, I'll give you children and outnumber the sun, or outnumber the stars, and they, they don't have any children. They're waiting for that child of promise. And to them, time's running out. And so they, they, they're having trouble trusting God. When they left Ur the Chaldees, Abraham was 75 years old and Sarah wasn't much younger. They were past childbearing years. They, at this, at this point in their life, they hadn't had children, and so they were never going to have children. Now Sarah had gone through the, the change, and so she couldn't have kids anyway. Abraham was an old man. They couldn't have kids anyway. And so they had lived the first 75 years of their life childless, and they kind of accepted that fate. They kind of accepted the fate that, well, we're not going to have children, so they invested a lot of time in their, in their, their business, a lot of time in their, 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 their property and their, their herds, and got a lot of money, got a lot of influence, got a lot of prestige, but still had no children. And then God comes to them and says, hey, I want you to leave everything you know and go where I'm going to show you, and I'm going to give you children. And they were excited. They trusted God. They set out leaving everything and everyone they knew except for Lot and followed God. And I am sure that this was a time of mixed emotions for Sarah and Abraham. They're scared of what lay ahead. Because God didn't come to them and say, hey, I'm going to have you leave her the Chaldees to go to this land right here. Let me show you to on a map. Let me show you all the, the top the topography of it. Let me show you what it looks like. Let me show you your boundaries. Let me show you how good it's going to be. He just said, I want you to leave where you're at and go, and, and I'll show you where to stop. So they're really they're unsure about where God's going to send them. They're unsure. I mean, he could have been sending them to West Virginia. That could have been bad. So they're, they're scared uncertain about what, what God is, is going to do. They're, they're sad about leaving their home, leaving their family. Abraham had to leave his dad, had to leave his family, his friends, everything he ever knew, but they're excited for what God's going to do. They're excited to see God work. They're, they're thrilled that after all this time, they're finally going to become parents. But a lot of time has passed since Genesis chapter 12. Eleven years have passed. Abraham is now 86 years old, and he still doesn't have a child. So as an old couple with no children and really no hope for children, they stopped trusting God. They begin to doubt. They begin to think of ways that they can make God's will happen on their timetable. They begin to stop waiting on God to work. So Sarah comes up with a plan. She tells Abraham, use my handmaid. Now, to us, this is just appalling, what she's, what she's suggesting. But in this culture, that's just that's the way it was. The handmaid was literally 
Sarah's property. She could do with her what she wanted to. And so she goes to Abraham and says, you know what, basically she's me anyway. She's part of me, so use her, have a child with her, and we'll make that child the child of promise. And so she, she thinks by manipulating God, by manipulating Hagar, by manipulating Abraham, she can bring the child of promise to them. And so Abraham listens to his wife. He goes to Hagar, she becomes pregnant, and Sarah, as soon as it happens, she gets jealous. Conflict arises. Now, I don't believe any of us can relate to these exact circumstances. But we've all dealt with the emotions that are involved. We've all dealt with jealousy. We've all dealt with anxiety. We've all dealt with anger. We've all dealt with doubt. We've all dealt with fear. We've all dealt with betrayal. Hagar is betrayed by Sarah. So how does God's word guide us in this complex web of relationships and emotions that they find themselves dealing with, but also that we find ourselves dealing with? When we're dealing with jealousy, when we're dealing with fear, when we're dealing with doubt, how does God's word guide us through this story to help us deal with these things. When we find ourselves in a situation where you feel betrayed or hurt by someone, the Bible guides us here. You can remember stories as this one and they can help comfort and guide you. So what did Hagar do in this situation? What did Hagar learn about God? How can her story guide our lives? Well, number one, we see that God, what is going on? Seriously, computer. All right, number one, if you want to see, look on the back. God sees us in our problems. God sees us in our problems. When Sarah comes to Hagar, she didn't really ask her to do this. It wasn't a, hey, this is a great idea. What do you think, Hagar? It was a command. She told Hagar to do this. And so Hagar, she obeys the wishes of Abraham and Sarah. She really didn't have a choice. They're her boss, so she didn't have a choice. But I'm, I'm sure she was glad to help them. Because typically the handmaid had a, a pretty good relationship with her master. And I'm sure she loved Sarah and Abraham. I'm sure she was glad to be able to help them have this child they've wanted for so long. And so she didn't have a choice, but she, she was glad to help them. She would have been able to give them what they had wanted for so long. She was able to help them fulfill their dream. But it doesn't work out the way she had hoped. Instead of being grateful, Sarah's jealous. Sarah's bitter. Sarah lashes out at her. And Hagar doesn't know what to do. So instead of trying to make her master happy, which she tried to do and failed, she's made her master sad and jealous. So what does she do? She runs away. She runs away from her problems. Can any of y'all relate to trying to run away from your problems? We've all done it. It doesn't work. You can run away from your problem, and guess what? They follow you wherever you're at. So you got to deal with them and face them. But Hagar's like, I'm just going to run away from my problem. So she runs away. Look at verse number 6 in chapter 16. It says, But Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai had dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So she, she tries to run away from her problem. She tries to run away from the situation. And the Bible tells us she, she goes out into the wilderness and she's, she's sitting by a well in the wilderness. She's, she's probably crying. She's distraught. Now she's a, a pregnant single mom who the foster family or adopted family that's supposed to take her kid that wanted her to do this anyway. You know, she's the surrogate. They, this family that's supposed to take him, they're mad at her. The Sarah hates her and is jealous with her. So she's sitting in this wilderness, in the wilderness by this well. She's crying. She's scared about what's going to happen when something amazing happens. An angel of the Lord appears to her. Look at verse number 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of shore. This isn't just any angel. Though 
let's be honest, an angel appearing would be incredible. If an angel showed up and started talking to her, it would be a, it would be a miracle. It would be amazing. It would encourage her and strengthen her. But this isn't just an angel. Anytime it is said, there are two types of heavenly visitors mentioned in the Bible. There is an angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord. Anytime it says an angel of the Lord appears, it is an angel. It's a messenger, typically Gabriel. An angel of the Lord came to Mary and told her she was going to have the, have the Messiah. An angel of the Lord came to Elizabeth and told her she was going to have uh, John the Baptist. So an angel of the Lord is an angel sent by God to a messenger from God. It's typically Gabriel uh, to give this message. But the angel of the Lord is someone different. It is not an angel. It is, a, it, is, it is an angel sent by God to man. It is God appearing to man. So this isn't some angel showing up, which again would be great, would be a miracle, would be awesome. But this isn't just some angel showing up to encourage this woman. This is God showing up to help this woman. And we can see this clearly in verse 10. When the angel says, look at verse 10, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered by multitude. This is the same promise God gave to Abraham when he left her of the county, saying, I will multiply. And God is the only one that can make this promise. Gabriel can't show up and say, hey, I'm Gabriel, I'm here, I'm going to multiply your seed. Gabriel doesn't have the power to do that. Only God has the power to do that. So this is not, an, this is an Old Testament appearance of God. God shows up to this woman. God finds this woman who's, who's crying. She's upset. She doesn't know what to do. She's distraught. And God comes to her to give her guidance and comfort and support. When we are facing problems, we are feeling abandoned and mistreated and betrayed and scared and doubting and anxious, God sees us and God sees us in our problems. What you're going through is not, God's not blind to it. God knows what you're facing. And look, I know a lot of times we feel like He is blind to it. I know a lot of times we think like, God, it, you, you, the Bible over and over and over again says you love me and you're going to take care of me, you're going to provide for me. But Lord, I'm facing this problem and it, it seems like you don't care. It seems like you don't know. But whatever you're facing, God sees you in it. Well, why, why hasn't he showed up to me? He has. You just haven't seen him. Because you're too focused on your problem instead of focused on God. And here's the thing, sometimes we have our problems, and God sees us, and God comes to us. Sometimes God says, I know what you're going through, but you're going to have to go through a little bit more. There's some things you've got to learn. There's some things you have to grow through. And so he sees you, but he says, I know it stinks, but this is necessary. So God sees us in our problems. Number two, God takes care of us in our problems. So God comes to Hagar, finds her in the wilderness crying upset, and he tells her to return to Abraham and hey and, and to return to Abraham and Sarah and he promises her that everything's going to be okay. That's what we read in eleven and twelve, where he says in there, Behold, thou with child, and you go back to Abraham and Sarah, go back to where you're supposed to be, and I'll bless you and I'll take care of you. And Ishmael will be a, a mighty nation. Hagar then makes this great declaration about God in verse 13 and she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her so she's by this well she's crying she's upset she doesn't know what to do she doesn't know what's going to happen and God shows up and a lot of times when that happens like you know Jacob he had to wrestle with God and he named the place that he wrestled with because he wrestled with God but she, he goes because I met God here I'm going to name this place she doesn't say because I met God here I'm going to name this place she says because I met God here I'm going to name God I'm going to give God a name about what he did for me and I will, she, I will, she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her 
Thou, God, seest me. For she said, I have also here looked after him that seeth me. So here, Hagar, she's, she's in the desert, she's pregnant, she's alone. And she, only, she discovers that she's suddenly not alone. That God is always with her. That he is watching over her, but also that he's watching out for her. That God sees her problem. That God sees her, but he's also going to do something about it. It's not simply that God is our creator. God is our father. When he sees our problems, he gets involved with our problems. He is watching his children. And when he sees conflict in our lives, when we run from them and we feel lost, God seeks us out. He goes after us. And in the moments we feel alone and abandoned, he lets us know that he sees us, he's looking out for us, and he is there to care for us. This is the revelation that Hagar had when she met God face to face. She said, God sees me and he's going to help me. But she didn't declare that she had, that she had seen God that she had seen this God. She said, Thou, God, seest me. The word see us there in the Hebrew, it's in the present active tense, meaning that God always sees her. Here's what Hagar's saying. She's saying, You are the God of seeing, and you are the God that is always watching over me. See, Hagar teaches us that God is, is an attentive God. He's not an absentee father. He's not too busy making sure the, the earth doesn't spin off into the sun that he can't take care of us. He is an attentive God. It is his nature. It is part of who he is. And we, when we learn these truths through this story, it guides our lives. Because we know God is an attentive God every single moment of our lives. No matter what you're going through, no matter how scared you may be, no matter how, uh, how alone or abandoned you may feel, God sees you and God helps you. Now, again, we may not like the way he helps, but he does what's best for us. So that's the thing about a good father. A good father doesn't give you what you want. A good father gives you what you need. Sometimes what you need hurts. Sometimes what you need is a little bit difficult. But God sees you, and God gets involved in your lives and your problems, and he gives you what you need, and he helps you. He is always with us. He is always watching over us. He is always involved in our lives. Through the good times and the bad times, he is always there. You know, in the grand scheme of things, we humans are, are pretty small. The universe is enormous. If you've ever done a study about how big the universe is, not even just our galaxy, our solar, our galaxy is incredibly huge. We can't even fathom it. And in this huge universe, and there's, this, there's millions of these galaxies, and in these millions of galaxies, there's this one galaxy, and in this one galaxy, there's millions of stars and planets, and on this one planet, there's us. In the grand scheme of things, we're, we're pretty small. I mean, if you really got to think about it, you could think, we're pretty insignificant. But in the vast universe, the Creator God sees us. He's attentive to us. He knows what we're going through, and he gets involved. It's easy to think we're insignificant and forgotten, especially when we're going through trials. But as we allow the Word of God to guide our lives, we learn that that's the furthest thing from the truth. You know, Matthew tells us that God even notices when a sparrow falls. A sparrow. I mean, sparrows are... Insignificant birds. I mean, I know they're pretty. I love feeding them. But let's be honest here. You hit one with your car, you don't think, you don't lose much sleep over it because a dumb sparrow should have gotten out of the road, right? But anytime a sparrow falls, God notices it. God sees it. 
A tiny, insignificant bird is something God looks after. Why? Because he fed that sparrow. He loved that sparrow because he created it. And if God notices when a sparrow falls, and he cares about a sparrow because he created it, when, when the sparrow's dead, it's dead, how much more does he care about us who have an eternal soul that he desires to spend eternity with? How much more does he care about us who he loves so much? He took on human form and came to earth and lived a perfect life and died a horrible death that we should have suffered and was buried and three days later rose again. He went through all that for us. If he notices a bird, how much more does he notice us? Hagar reminds us that God not, God not only watches over the sparrows, he watches over us. He sees us and he helps us. He heard this soon-to-be mom crying in the wilderness alone and afraid, and he heard her. In her darkest hour, she saw the God who had seen her. And that's how God's word can guide your life. You can remember you're not alone. You're never alone. You're never forgotten. God sees you and cares deeply about you. And this, this truth has the potential to shape our interactions with everyone, including ourselves, on a daily basis. You don't have to fear because you're not alone. In addition to that, you need to be mindful of how you live because God also sees you then. How does this truth affect us? We know, no matter what we're going through, God always sees us and God always helps us.